Thank you very much, PK, uh, for the introductory words. And I'd like to thank the organizers, especially Rajiv Varshni, for inviting me here. I'm very pleased to be here. You invited me several times before and it never happened to, uh, to work out with my agenda, but I'm happy to be here this year and I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great meeting. And uh, I'm also glad that I have five more minutes. That gives me... <laughs> <laughs> well, no, just kidding. I try to stay in time. Okay, I'm here to talk about Bali. It's not the main crop for India. I hope, though, that uh, we can still make a case here because Bali is very closely related to wheat and many things that we do in Bali is also, of course, of relevance for wheat. So I want to talk to you uh, about Bali, the status of the Bali genome sequencing, and how this influences our current approaches for uh, capturing genetic diversity and uh, yeah, setting up new tools for for cloning genes and discover traits. So for those of you who are not working with barley, this is how a normal six-row barley field looks like in many places of the world. Um, not very exciting, but uh, if you look into a diversity collection, then you see that it's not all about barley. Barley is a very diverse crop. It has a huge amount of genetic diversity in exigu gene collections. And so you can have very different type of ears. So this is just a, a very narrow uh, uh, survey of genetic or, or morphological diversity in the, in the ear or in the spike of the barley plant. But it just tells you there is a lot of diversity that is useful for uh, genetic studies. And of course also for crop improvement, but from a genetics point of view that is more useful for gene isolation. Barley. Uh, is a very important crop globally. It is number two crop in uh, Europe, number five worldwide for uh, acreage in, in small grains. It's mainly grown for feed production, animal feed, but it has also an important role in, in human nutrition in many parts of the world. Uh, here, close by in the, in the Himalayans, barley is a very important uh, source of the human diet as well. 10% um, of the barley production goes into malting, and uh, as I said in the introductory words, it is also since last century, barley for long was a very important genetic model for the Tritici crop species because it has a much simpler genome than wheat. It is a true diploid genome. I'm talking about barley genome sequencing and I don't need to go into the reasons why it's important to do genome sequencing after the introductory talk from uh, uh, Dr. Jana Shapiro. Um, but there's a reason why this genome hasn't been sequenced yet finally or, or to a final stage or reference genome quality stage. And the reason is the size. You see here an on-scale comparison of the metaphase of Aridopsis, the first plant species uh, sequence to reference uh, sequence quality. It is 150 megabase. And here is the barley genome of 5 gigabase. That's two times the human genome or the corn genome. Though it's a true diploid, which makes uh, things much easier in terms uh, or in comparison to polyploids. But still, it's a huge genome. And the reason for the size is not because it has many, many more genes uh, than other species. It's just that it's packed full of repetitive DNA. And uh, just from survey sequencing and statistical analysis of the sequence, one could already extrapolate that there's more than 80% of repetitive DNA in the genome. So, in 2006, uh, International Consortium formed to still uh, tackle this uh, problem of sequencing the barley genome, and we followed the example of many other genome projects before. We thought because the genome is complex and packed full of repetitive DNA, we need to establish first a physical map and then use this as a, as a template for high-quality reference sequencing. So, just as a reminder for those of you who are not working in genome sequencing, if you want to do it the classical way, you start from large insert genomic libraries, bug libraries, and you uh, build first a physical map of your genome. This has to be done with a significant amount of redundancy. So you cover each part of the genome several times, and then before sequencing, you just deduce the non-redundant overlapping path of large insert clones. And this needs to be anchored to a high-density genetic map, and then you know where you are in the genome, and then you can sequence each chromosome along the physical map. If you look into uh, the main genome papers that are published nowadays, most of these follow 
The shortcut version, the whole genome shotgun sequencing approach, which is very useful, especially in small genome <coughs> crops, um, is also useful in large genome species, but mainly to address the gene space, so the non-repetitive part of the genome. And so here you don't clone the DNA into a large insert library, but you just cut it to much smaller pieces, mainly mechanically, and that is then immediately transferred into a sequencing library and on the large high throughput uh, sequencing facilities we have today from the next generation sequencing technology. You generate huge amount of sequencing data. You try then by bioinformatic means only to find the overlaps in the sequence and reconstruct the genome. As I said, this approach is useful also in large genomes with repetitive, a lot of repetitive DNA, but mainly to assemble the gene space. So in Bali, we combined these two approaches in a first step towards sequencing the Bali genome, and that work has been published in 2012, uh, and we call it the Bali gene-ohm. We were not allowed to use this term in the publication, but we think it is very intuitive because it is really what it is. We have a physical map of the Bali genome that's represented here by these bars in the center, and the colored bars here just give you the gene density that we could uh, study on the physical map in the genetic map, and we could anchor into this physical map a lot of sequence information, mainly by, so the physical map, first of all, comprises 7,000 bug contexts. We have seven G, uh, chromosomes, that means above, uh, around 1,000 contexts uh, in every chromosome. Half of it, or, or more than half of it, almost two-thirds of the genome could be anchored to a genetic map. We have a lot of sequences from the ends of the clones. We have sequenced a lot of bug clones, just randomly selected. And we have this whole genome shotgun assembly of 1.2 gigabases and 300 megabase of this whole genome shotgun assembly could be integrated by the sequence information and by, the, uh, by, by anchored markers into this physical framework. And that allowed us to study gene density in the genetic map and in the physical map. But we have here really a gene-centric view on the physical genetic uh, organization of the Bali genome. We could anchor it at high density, mainly by help of markers derived by Jesse Poland, by genotyping, by sequencing. Half a million markers at that time allowed us to anchor to the genetic map, and we had 20,000 of the predicted 30,000 genes in this framework. So, although very useful for doing uh, new approaches in, in Bali research, it is not yet a, a reference genome sequence, as you would call it. Uh, by the example of RICE, for instance. In RICE, also a physical map was constructed that's indicated here by the blue bars. So each chromosome of RICE is represented by a high-quality physical map with very few gaps. And the physical map of RICE was completely sequenced, so there are few remaining gaps in the, in the RICE genome. In Bali, we talk about many more physical map contexts that <coughs> represent the chromosome, and only part of the physical map was yet sequenced in the publication in 2012. An additional problem was there since we worked with, uh, with genetic anchoring only. We have a huge physical region of each chromosome where we have just a single genetic bin. Genetic centromere covers half of the chromosome or even more, and we have no clue about the physical order of this information that is in this region. And this is still a region where there are many genes present. So this is the structure of the situation for one chromosome, but it of course applies to all seven chromosomes, and then there are as I said, there are 7,000 contexts and only 4,500 were integrated into the genetic map. There is quite a number of, or quite an amount of information that is still not integrated into the seven chromosomes and forms almost a, an eight chromosome, a virtual chromosome zero. So we need more information to come closer to a reference sequence. So we need a higher density genetic marker map. We need higher resolution marker map. And we need a better integration and physical order resolution. So um, we have followed a few approaches to improve that situation. And one is uh, an approach we call population sequencing. It is anchoring the gene space by sequencing a population to survey sequence uh, depth. So this is just a general outline of the approach. You generate a de novo shotgun assembly of your genome of interest, and we had this for Bali, 50x genome coverage. It is rather a lousy assembly, very small context, but the genes are well represented. And you have a, genera a, a framework genetic map, and then you sequence a, each individual of a small mapping population to very shallow coverage. That's whole genome shotgun sequencing. If you have a genome of five gigabase, you still accumulate a lot of sequence information if you sequence 100 individuals. You do then 
you're read mapping from the next generation sequencing data to your whole genome shotgun assembly and you do SNP mining and you determine the SNP frequency on the whole genome shotgun context and you can handle them like genetic markers and order your whole genome shotgun context into the framework map. We did this with two populations, both uh, homozygous individuals from uh, uh, F8 real population or from a double tabloid population and then we could read map, uh, map the reads against our whole genome shotgun assembly compared to the reference map and integrate then based on the SNP frequencies on this whole genome shotgun context to the markers. Uh, we could then order like beads on the string uh, the physical context from the whole genome shotgun assembly into the genetic map. This was very useful. In fact, we could data mine 11 million SNPs out of this work and integrate from the 1.2 gigabase or 1.2 gigabase of the 1.9 gigabase assembly uh, into the genetic map and position 80% of the annotated genes of the barley genome assembly to a genetic position. We compared this to the published physical map anchored gene space and the genetically uh, anchored gene space and we got a very, sorry, a very good uh, congruency of these two data sets. But the message is here, even without a physical map for any genome of interest, you could generate a genetically anchored gene space by this approach and that's very important. The second issue was uh, genetic resolution. Um, we sequenced with genotyping by sequencing over 2,000 individuals of an advanced real population and we could generate a map of about 3,000 high quality SNPs from that data and we have now a reference map with below centimorgan resolution which is very very useful to order uh, the genetic map or, or the physical map information in the distal parts of the chromosomes. I can tell here without going into details that although this is really a very useful resource for the genetic centromeres it is not providing you any additional information. Yeah? We have no additional uh, information for ordering the physical map in the genetic centromeres and that is as I said over half of the chromosome. Um, but the below centimorgan resolution is now very important to order our physical map information towards the telomeres. You see here that individual co uh, clones in the context uh, carry uh, high quality SNPs with different genetic positions. And if you look at sequence clusters out of the chromosome sequencing, we see that we have over 97% uh, consistency with clone order in sequence clusters and physical map clusters and genetic map positions. So, this is a useful information for ordering uh, the physical map in regions where we have sufficient genetic recombination. The third issue was physical map resolution, really. Um, and we uh, were lucky that Alan Schulman won uh, a lottery from BioNanoGenomics at the PAC conference in 2014, uh, where they said the winner of the lottery can have a bio nano optical map for his genome of interest and then he raised his hand we want barley and we were of course very happy so I don't go into the details of the technology but bio nano technology is uh, offering a platform that allows you to do optical maps which means you generate high molecular weight DNA over 200 kb in average insert size or uh, average size and you directly label the DNA molecules by a an enzyme that doesn't introduce restriction uh, uh, cuts but just nicks and then there is a replacement uh, repair that introduces then fluorescent uh, labels into this restriction sites and then you run these large molecules through nanopores and you line up the molecules with very characteristic um, uh, optic, uh, uh, fluorescent patterns and you can generate physical maps. You don't have sequence information here but you, you can construct a genome map based on that technology. And BioNano generated an optical map of Bali with 52x genome coverage and yeah, so this is how this looks uh, schematically but there are about 3,000 of these optical contexts of uh, 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 labeled molecules that total to a map length of 4.3 gigabase. So 84% of the Bali genome is represented in these optical contexts. And now because these uh, labels ha are at a specific sequence that you can survey in your shotgun sequence or in your sequenced uh, back clones, you can integrate this optical map now to your physical map and your sequence uh, resource. So it's, it's very useful and will be useful to order information, especially in the genetic centromeres. So 
The consortium is working towards sequencing the physical map, buck clone by buck clone, and we have accomplished this endeavor for six chromosomes by contributions of different partners, and we are waiting for the final data set of one of the chromosomes, and by end of March, hopefully, we have all that shotgun sequence information in place, do the assemblies, and then integrate all the different data sets, and we are pretty optimistic that we can publish this year the first what you would call reference sequence of the Bali genome. So much about the status of the Bali genome sequencing. I want to give you in the remaining time, which is still 14 minutes, um, 10 minutes actually, with five minutes discussion. I want to give you two examples how we can use already the sequence resource that is not yet at reference sequence quality level for serving genetic diversity in this crop species and also how we can use it to do very efficient uh, cloning by sequencing of genes. Why am I interested in serving genetic diversity? Our institute uh, hosts the largest uh, exit gene bank in the EU 29, um, and we have a huge collection on barley. Barley is kind of a lead crop for uh, research at IPK Gardasleben. We have a collection of over 20,000 barley accessions, and what I showed you in, in one of the early slides, there is a tremendous morphological diversity that is of course also represented in genetic diversity and if you would be able to directly uh, select germplasm by a very informed uh, approach for, for breeding purposes that would be really very useful. So we, are, we have an interest to really unlock this genetic resource. Um, of course with a 5 gigabase genome it's still too early to think about sequencing each accession to whole genome coverage so we need a possibility to uh, do re uh, complexity reduction and we teamed up with Roche Nimbleton and partners at Dundee in, in Scotland and, and Minnesota, also in Kansas, to, to establish um, uh, a so-called exome capture assay, a liquid phase exome capture assay. What is this? It is nothing else than a mixture of oligonucleotides that represent your gene space. And these oligos are linked to a biotin label which allows you to pull out these oligos after hybridization to genomic DNA from a solution. So you shear up your genomic DNA to small fragments that are suitable for direct sequencing. You end repair and then they are already in a format that you can use them on a sequencing platform. You hybridize to your oligo mix, pull out your gene space uh, with strep avidine coated magnetic beads and then after hybridization and washing mainly exons are kept on these oligos and you can then directly use this for high throughput sequencing. So our capture is designed on the basis of the annotated genes. So we have RNA sequencing data that was used to annotate the gene space on the whole genome shotgun assembly. We have a huge amount of data from full length cDNA from a different genotype and we did also de novo RNA sequencing assembly because the whole genome shotgun assembly of course is not fully representative of the genome yet. In total, we had 61 megabase of non-overlapping target space covering most of the high confidence annotated genes and a lower amount of the low confidence genes. And if you then look into the sequencing data, this is one example. We have, as I said, a, a very uh, lousy whole genome shotgun assembly, but still there are long contacts representing the structure of individual genes. So this is a five kilobase contact with a gene of three exons. And this histogram shows you the read coverage out of such an exome capture experiment for this gene. And you see that this, the gene space is very efficiently captured. There's almost no off-target read here. And if you sequence to sufficient sequencing depth, you may be able to even bridge small introns that are not represented by oligos. So it's very powerful and um, very useful. And we used it to capture the diversity from the gene space from different barley genotypes. These are just two two-road uh, barley genotypes. You see we have sequence diversity distribution here along the seven chromosomes and higher sequence diversity towards the telomeres, always a drop of diversity towards the centromeres, which is to some extent represented here also by the distribution of genes, of course. Um, but this platform is not only useful for cultivated barley, but it's useful also to capture diversity in wild barleys. We did this with spontaneum and also with bulbosum. And you can capture uh, about 250,000 to 1 million SNPs in the gene space of different uh, accessions uh, in, in cultivated in wild barley. And you see here that, as we would expect for spontaneum and bulbosum, you have an increase of diversity uh, of, of an order of magnitude between bulbosum and, and vulgare. So this platform is very useful and efficient. 
And we use it not only to capture diversity in, in germplasm, but we use it also for, uh, well, this is just an example. We are in a process with, together with groups in, in Scotland and in, in Minnesota to capture the diversity in 137 land races and 130 in spontaneum to get a good idea of gene uh, sequence diversity and also some evolution in barley. But I won't talk about this here. I want to show you how we use this complexity reduction tool also to uh, do mapping of genes and, and cloning of genes. And uh, this idea was introduced by Delef Weigel's group a while ago. He combined the bulk segregant analysis that many of you who are involved in genetic mapping with molecular markers are familiar of. If you want to find a genetic marker that is closely linked to your trait of interest, you do two contrasting pools uh, and then you, tr you look uh, for, for uh, the inheritance of your marker in that pool. So if you mix, uh, if you generate two phenotypic pools from a segregating population at the target locus of interest, all genotypes should be homozygous, the donor genotype for your morphological gene. So if you would sequence the DNA pool, of, uh, the DNA of such a pool, you could ask uh, for the distribution of SNPs in, in your reference sequence. So you would do your read mapping against your reference. You find uh, segregation of your SNPs. So this is an unlinked locus with 50% SNP uh, frequency. If you would go along the chromosome in a sliding window approach, you would approach to the target locus with 100% SNP uh, uh, allele of your donor parent here in this population and 25 to 30% in, in, the, in the opposite uh, pool. So this approach called CHORMAP was shown to be very efficient in Iridopsis, a genome that is sequenced to high quality and where you can follow this approach also by whole genome shotgun sequencing. But we were interested in how far we can get in Bali with a patchy genome sequence and a huge genome sequence where we have to apply uh, complexity reduction for that, such an approach. And I want to give you this example on a gene that is maybe not too relevant for breeding, but it is, uh, it is uh, just showing the case. So this is a gene or a mutant that was induced by uh, radiation in the 50s, 60s at IPK, a mutant called many noted dwarf. It uh, increases the plastochrone, so the initiation of nodes and leaves. So you have a higher number of nodes and leaves. And under field conditions, you have another set of pleiotropic effects. So you don't think necessarily that this is useful for breeding, but it is definitely very useful to understand uh, fundamental biology of the problem. We generated a small mapping population, 100 F2 plants, and we made just two pools, two phenotypic pools. One was mutant and one was wild type. So we took all the mutant individuals from the small population, pooled it in, in one uh, DNA pool, and we used 25 wild type, which would be homozygous wild type and heterozygous because it's a recessive gene. We sequenced these two pools after exome capture and plotted the sequence diversity of the two pools against our reference map. And we could clearly identify a locus on chromosome 5H, which was coinciding with the previously known location of the gene. The resolution, of course, was not very high, which you couldn't expect with 100 F2. But we could survey then for gene deletion in the reference genome. And there was only a single gene that was deleted and co-segregating with the phenotype this was in a physical context carrying a single gene. It is a member of a cytochrome P450 family. And um, although we were already convinced that this is our gene of interest, uh, we then looked in a subsequent step into uh, alternative mutant collections. So there is a huge collection of mutants at the Nordic Gene Bank in Sweden. We got 37 accessions that were um, annotated as carrying a many noted dwarf phenotype. And in 28 of them, we found a functional change in the gene that we identified by this uh, mapping by sequencing approach. There were complete deletions, larger deletions, disrupted splice sites, premature stops, and non-synonymous amino acid changes. And furthermore, we have a tilling population that is EMS induced in, uh, in a two-road barley at IPK, which we use for functional genomics. So tilling is targeting induced local lesions in genomes. You screen the DNA of many thousand plants to identify mutations in your Canada gene. And we had a, a, a stop codon mutant in our Barker tilling population and three examples for deletions, non synonymous SNPs, and stop codons in the other resource, all showing the higher plastochrone, so a clear confirmation of the identi identity of the gene. So 
I come to the summary. I hope that I could give you a good idea of where we are with uh, physical mapping and, and sequencing the body gene space and uh, something I couldn't talk about, but we have pretty similar resources available now also for wheat with a paper in science last summer and also for rye. So for all the 3DC genomes, and that's why I gave you the example of mapping by sequencing here, please think about your approaches. Yeah? In, in all the other species, we can basically go the same way. We are in the process of sequencing all the chromosomes along the physical map, and we, we are optimistic that we finish that work this year. And uh, this allows us now to do completely new things in these important crop species. We can survey nature genetic diversity at much, much higher efficiency, and uh, we can do association genetics, GWAS in Bali. There are many examples already in, the pa in, in, in published work. And I think we have all tools available to really apply um, genomics-based breeding in the 3DC, and uh, Mark will give a talk later in this conference, and, and breeders are doing this exactly now in Bali, at least in, in Europe as far as I know. So that's what I always tell to a different audience. I don't have to stress this here. I think it's really time to spend our energy working in crops, and we have the resources in many crops now available, and in crops where we don't have it, we have examples and ways to go forward very quickly to generate these resources at much lower cost than 10 years ago. This is work of a large number of people. There are many people, I cannot list them or name them all, uh, from my group involved in physical mapping and sequencing and mapping by sequencing. We collaborate a lot with the bioinformatics team at IPK and at the MIPS at Munich, and we had collaborators for sequencing, uh, for phenotyping in different aspects, collaborators at Scotland, Minnesota, JGI, uh, for, for the PopSeq approach, also with uh, um, where is he? Jesse Poland from KSU, and for the different chromosome sequencing, Ching Dao Li, Mats Hansen, Wu Ping Zhang, Alan Schulman are also PIs on some of the chromosomes, and a lot more international collaborators, all under the framework of the International Body Sequencing Consortium, and funding of my research comes mainly from Ministry of Education Research in Germany, and these two programs from EU funding and the German Research Council. Thank you very much. questions comments thanks Neil, for updating information because I've been seriously following you uh, I have one question about the application of our new technology or the sequencing information so can we use this information to increase the crossing over around the centromeric region where some of the genes well, critical genes are residing there so the question is, um, I mean, I addressed the question of, or the problem of uh, reduced recombination across the centromeres, and especially if you have their negative genes that cause linkage drag, you want to get them removed by a crossover, or you want to have a good selection for a useful gene there. Can we do it now with the tools? Of course, the tools allow us now to trace these events much, much more precisely at a physical resolution. And... Um, there are groups that try to use uh, mainly abiotic stress treatments to increase meiotic crossover uh, frequency. It is useful, it is possible, but I think you cannot uh, push it really to the limits because the reason why we have more crossovers towards the telomeres is maybe just explained by the size of the genomes, yeah? that the meiotic machinery is just not finishing in time. Uh, to, to, ha to allow a lot of crossovers towards the centromeres as well. So I think we are just in the, in, this, in the early stages of understanding this process completely, but there are approaches to do it and we have the tools to trace it. Take home message for wheat sequence. I'm from wheat side. So can you suggest something for the wheat sequencing? For the from wheat sequencing? The oh, oh this is a political area now. <laughs> Um, I have my clear recommendations. I'm struggling in discussing this issue. I'm, I think what I showed you is that we basically do the same as the Wheat Genome Project. We are convinced that sequencing the chromosomes along the physical map is a very useful thing. Um, we did a lot of things on our way towards that yeah, because we were not yet ready to do many uh, this genome sequencing along the physical map immediately, so we tried a lot of things and we are in close discussion with the Wheat community about it. Um, I think at the moment it would be very useful uh, to get the, the, the physical map sequence for sure. But um, there are other tools I couldn't talk about um, that allow you also to anchor uh, whole genome shotgun assemblies 
Uh, in, in the genetic centromeres without a physical map, if you're interested, we can talk over in, in the break. Um, we use it in Bali as well, so not only the optical map we use for ordering the physical map in the centromeres, but we use 3D confirmation sequencing, which is extremely powerful and would be useful also in wheat. And uh, yeah, I think they should focus on getting the chromosome sequenced, but also include the alternative approach on the way. But, but you do not need to wait, that's maybe the main take-home message, you don't need to wait until you have the finished genome assembly, because you're in wheat, you can do things like I showed you with the mapping by sequencing on the basis of the data that's in the public domain. Uh, Time uh, is up, but we can have a, one short, quick yes, question. Yes, very short. Please identify yourself before uh, you put up the question. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I'm uh, work on rice. So my experience also in human genome and rice genome and other, other plant animal genomes, the repeats are major important currently what we are understanding. Are you looking at repeats in the yes. barley genome? What kind of repeats? Or Any repeats. I mean, generally now discarding the repeats because we can't assemble and we are discarding right um, now. Are you, they are also associated with the trites and epigenetics. Are you looking those? Well, I'm not sure whether I understood your uh, question completely, but um, your, your question about the representation of the repeats in the sequence? Yes, repeat space. Um, well, this is of course at the moment underrepresented because at the whole genome shotgun sequence level with the physical map based sequence, if we sequence the back clones, we have usually the, back, uh, the gene space integrated in assembled repetitive DNA space. So we have with the map based sequence in Bali, a, a, a majority of the context is represented in assembled sequence. So we, we know about the neighborhood of genes and the repetitive DNA and we can address which repetitive elements are in proximity to genes. Okay, then uh, I think we should uh, time it up. Uh, let's give a big hand to Dr. Stein.